So I talk about power integrity for sensitive circuits and what exactly is that? What's a sensitive circuit? How do we even know if a circuit is sensitive? And that's really a subjective and relative term. But I will tell you that in, in general terms, there are things that are particularly sensitive and mostly that's the LNAs. It's things that have reference clocks. It's the reference clocks themselves. Uh, most things that have phase lock loops are, are really sensitive. And how do we know if it's sensitive? Um, how, do we, how do we manage to design around a sensitive circuit without under-designing or over-designing? I mean, either one is a bad thing, right? If we over-design it, then we spent too much money and we took up too much real estate. And if we under-design it, then we don't get the performance that we're supposed to get. And so those are all of the things that I want to talk about uh, this morning, or how it is that we navigate uh, the design of, of power rails for sensitive circuits. So what is a sensitive circuit? There's, uh, there are lots of circuits that we consider to be hypersensitive, and those are things that can actually amplify low levels of noise. And again, that tends to be LNAs, and it tends to be things that have phase lock loops, including the, the reference clocks themselves. And we don't really know exactly what that means, because in general terms, there aren't any data sheet parameters that tell us specifically about the sensitivity of these circuits, or even what it is that that means, or what, uh, what particular frequencies they're sensitive to. In fact, in most data sheets, when you buy a reference clock, it doesn't even tell you how it is that they measured it. So you go and you spend all your money on this 50 femtosecond clock, we have no idea how it is that they measured it or verified it, and I can tell you that I spend lots of time working with engineers in the lab as a consultant helping them to troubleshoot these low noise problems. And I can tell you that I usually walk in and there they are with an oscilloscope probe looking for voltage noise. And I can tell you this noise is typically on the order of a few microvolts. I promise you, you won't see it on an oscilloscope. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about how it is that we measure it. For the purposes of this discussion, we're really only concerned with the sensitivities to power supply noise. There are sensitivities to other things. We're only interested in the sensitivity as it relates to power supply noise. Why? Because I'm a power supply guy. It's what it is that I do. So what does it mean that it's sensitive? And how do we address sensitivity? And how do we look for it? So the first thing that we have to understand is that almost all semiconductor circuits, independent of what they are, have some degree of, of nonlinearity to them. And yes, there are op amps that say um, very linear front end, and that means that they've tried to minimize that nonlinearity. But a silicon junction by itself is a nonlinear element, and for you RF guys, you already know that they make really good mixers. Anything that's a nonlinear device generates harmonics, and everything that ge generates harmonics uh, can generate uh, noise. Here we're just using a diode. It's a sim simple, single junction semiconductor, and we can use that to represent nonlinear elements. In fact, a lot of RF guys use diodes as mixers. And we connected two signals to that diode. Right, they're 50 ohm signal generators, and so we couldn't put bias through them, add a DC voltage, and we'll get some current through the diode. And then we can put two frequencies, one from each function generator. Both of those will appear at the junction, and we can see what it is that it's going to look like, but it is going to take some nonlinear effect of these frequencies. And we look at that, we can look at the first frequency, which we'll call the carrier, and there's only a single tone. And then we can add the modulation, our second oscillator, and now all of a sudden you can see the sidebands, right? So there are plus and minus offsets. And one of the interesting things about that is that it truly is a mixer. So while we put in a 500 kilohertz signal, what we're actually getting out is 99.5 megahertz, which is the mixing product of a 100 megahertz carrier and a 500 kilohertz noise signal. And so we effectively mixed power supply noise with the carrier, and we ended up with two offsets. And you can see there they are, plus and minus, they're symmetrical. What happens if I make that power supply noise just a little bit bigger? If I make it bigger, you can see that all of a sudden we get lots more mixing products, and they show up at all of the harmonics of the, uh, 
sums and differences of the carrier and the noise that we inject. In an actual system, these noise frequencies, yeah, we have a carrier and we have the noise, and the noise can be at many, many frequencies. And how many frequencies? Well, it really just depends on the sources, but I'll give you some indications. Um, yesterday, I mentioned that I worked on the atomic clock that's on the GPS, and in particular, there are two clocks, uh, rubidium clocks and cesium clocks, and they use two different atomic clocks for redundancy. They don't want to rely on a single uh, atomic element, and so they have a mixture of cesium and rubidium clocks. In the rubidium clock itself, they use this uh, concept to create the atomic clock. And in fact, they use a diode to do it. So uh, they start out with a 13.4 megahertz crystal. They make a very accurate 13.4 megahertz crystal oscillator. Um, the crystal, by the way, one of them comes from here in Israel, no fetch. Uh, but anyway, so we make this 13.4 megahertz oscillator. We generate a big signal like this, so we get lots of spurs. And then we tap off the 537th mixing product, which happens to be 6.9 gigahertz, and that is the atomic frequency of rubidium. So how many of these spurs can we get? I can tell you we tuned the clock to the 537th mixing product. How far do they go? Forever, almost forever. Uh, only limited by the, the step rise time of the diode. And in the same way, we did have a terrible noise problem with the GPS clock a few years ago, and they called me in to, to figure out what it was, and it turned out to be that one of these little spurs uh, was mixing the 1,530 second harmonic of the switching frequency of the power supply got into the phase lock loop, 1,530 second harmonic. So once we generate these spurs, there are, there are not a few like this, there's thousands of them. And they can be everywhere and anywhere and, uh, and every sum and different frequency of every signal that's on the board. And so if you take you know, uh, two switching power supplies that have two different switching frequencies and do all of those sums and differences, we end up with thousands and thousands of mixing products very quickly. And if we try to look at that in a spectrum plot, it'll look something like this. And we try to characterize this noise in two different ways. We talk about noise as random noise, and we can see that as the, the general uh, 1 over f, 1 over f squared, 1 over f cubed noise terms. And then we can see the discrete terms, and the discrete terms show up as spurs. Of course, we care about both. Now, depending on your sensitive circuit, you're more interested in one than in the other. For example, if you happen to be a manufacturer of spectrum analyzers or oscilloscopes, you really don't really want to see the spurs because the spurs get into your measurements and those set your spurious free dynamic range. So it directly impacts your dynamic range. On the other hand, when we look at jitter, jitter is made up of two parts. The jitter part that's related to an individual spur and the jitter part that's made up of the random noise terms. Spurs themselves don't really create much jitter. It takes a lot of spurs to generate a lot of jitter, but the random noise does a lot of damage. Where does all of this noise come from? The majority of this noise comes from the power supply. In fact, uh, the vast majority of, of it comes from the power supply. And I find that also fascinating because when we do our simulations and we do our our uh, designs of these sensitive circuits, we generally don't include the power supply. And we, that's, that's not by accident. Most simulators can't actually do that. Uh, but at the end of the day, and I promise you, I don't know if it'll be five years from now or whether it's going to be 10 years from now, every simulation will be end to end. Because if I want to assess the jitter in my data channel, a lot of that is going to come from the reference clock. And the jitter in the reference clock came from the power supply, so how do I assess that without the power supply noise? That doesn't make any sense. If most of the noise came from the power supply, then the power supply noise must be in the simulation. And so eventually we'll assess all of this in one singular end-to-end -end, uh, simulation. When we actually look at a clock, we get some different kinds of pictures. Here's a phase noise plot of uh, a clock that's on one of our demonstration boards. And I, I designed this demonstration board for my book, Power Integrity, but we've been using it for many years now. 
and we have different power supplies and different filters on that board so that we can see how it is that those impact our, our clock. And one of the things that you can see is as I change the power supplies between one power supply and the other, the low frequency noise stays relatively constant. The one over F noise, that's probably the one over F noise from the amplifier that's in the oscillator. And then the high frequency, we can generate spurs, and those generally come from the switching frequency of the power supply. But all of the jitter damage really occurs right here. That's at relatively low frequency, and this is in this case, it's about 20 kilohertz. And so 20 kilohertz gets into this clock and generates relatively large amounts of noise. And this integrates very well. This integrates much faster than the spurs do. And so most of the jitter comes from this little blur right there. And so this morning we're going to talk about how that gets there and why that gets there and how to fix it and how to decide exactly what the optimum solution is so that we don't over-design or under-design our, our power supply. And that's, that's really our major interest is how to not over-design or under-design it but in order to come up with the exact solution that will work. Now this is actually a fascinating topic itself and I like to talk about two engineers that I had the opportunity to work with for a few years. Um, both of them worked for Texas Instrument. One worked in uh, Germany, I believe, and the other one worked in Dallas. And they had very different opinions, even though they both worked for Texas Instrument. One of them, Thomas New in Germany, writes many, many articles about why he uses switching power supplies to generate power for his very sensitive circuits. That seems a little bit counterintuitive because switching power supplies would seem noisy, right? Uh, but they have other benefits. They have very low impedance and, and so on and so forth. The other guy, Masashi Nagawa, he designs very high PSR regulators for clock applications. And he writes many papers about why you should never use a switching power supply to power a sensitive circuit. Now, I could understand it if they came from different companies, right? That would make a little bit of sense. They're duking it out. These are two really smart guys that work for the same company. How could they disagree on something as simple and fundamental as to whether or not we should use linear regulators or switching regulators to power sensitive circuits? Well, you very quickly realize using lateral thinking that if these guys really are both smart and neither one has a bias in company, then there must not be an answer. And that's the truth. There is not an answer, and that's why it is that they can't agree. I met Masashi because he came to my lab to borrow my RSA 5000 to make measurements of his new power supply. One of the things that struck me about Masashi when he showed up at my door is he was a very young guy. And I don't know how many of you know clock designers. There are no young clock designers. <laughs> it takes decades to become a clock designer. So our first question I asked Masashi when he told me he was designing a line of regulators for clocks. I said, Masashi, how many clocks have you designed? You look like a young guy. And he says, none. And I said, that would make you the perfect guy to figure out how to design power for clock. Somebody that's never seen a clock. Awesome. I said, so I'm going to do you a favor, and you're going to hate me. TI makes really good saw clocks. I would like you to send them your regulator. See what they think. He did better than that, and he went to Dallas for three months with a box of his regulators. And he came back three months later, to his credit, with reams of data. And I said, Masashi, what did they like about your regulator? And he said, Steve, not an effing thing. And I said, okay, so there's the first rule. If you want to design power for a clock, you must understand and think like a clock. So, so we need to understand how this gets generated. We need to understand how it got there. And we need to understand why it is that we can't agree on whether or not this needs to be solved by using a switching regulator or a linear regulator. And I'm going to get into that today. First thing we need to know before we even design anything is we need to know whether or not the sensitive circuit that we chose meets our requirements. So I go and I buy this clock and I want to know what the phase noise or what the jitter of this clock is. I could go to the data sheet and the data sheet says it's 100 femtoseconds. I can tell you that's meaningless. It doesn't mean anything at all. To me, it means zero, because they didn't tell me how they measured it. They didn't tell me what the noise into the clock was. I have no idea what that means. So I need to get a single measurement. And the single measurement that I need is what is the phase noise and jitter look like with no noise on the power supply? So I need a noiseless power supply. 
That's not possible. There's no such thing as a noiseless power supply. So how do we make a noiseless power supply? We don't, we approximate noiseless. We get as close as we can to noiseless. And that's one of the things that PicoTest makes is a, a power supply modulation uh, ratio injector. And what that means is that we have this little box and inside the little box, there's something called a Wenzel stripper. Uh, for those of you that don't know Wenzel, Wenzel was probably the best clock designer of our generation. Uh, he probably, his company still makes the, the greatest clocks in the world. He's dead now, but he had a fascination with power supply noise and how it gets into clocks. And he developed many, many techniques for eliminating noise from power supply rails. And he called them uh, ripple strippers. So the very first thing that we come into our box, we have a damping network. And after the damping network, we actually have a Wenzel ripple stripper. And that takes all of the noise or as much of it as it possibly can off of the power supply. Then there's a linear summing element. And I said, every semiconductor device has mixing products. So I won't say this doesn't have mixing products. What I'll say is we've linearized it to the maximum extent that we could. There's a bias network that provides the, the offset voltage, and then there's a high current buffer. And one of the things that you don't see here is a feedback loop. There is no feedback loop. It's one of the reasons that this is able to do what it does, and it's also one of the biggest sources of complaints is that it's not a regulated output. If we regulated the output, then we would get the noise of a closed loop. We can't tolerate noise, so we made it open loop. Open loop means we get very low noise, and it also means that you're constantly adjusting voltage and so on and, and so forth. But that's about the closest we can get to noise free. And of course, we need something to measure. So in our demo board, in the demo board that, that I'm showing here, um, we have a couple of clocks, and we have some clock buffer circuits. And then there's two power supplies, a switching regulator, and there's also a linear regulator. And we can choose different capacitors for them to, to make noise different. We have SMA connectors where we can measure the noise. And we have clock outputs where we can measure phase noise and jitter. And so what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to measure the phase noise and jitter of these sensitive circuits with different levels of noise, and we want to try and equate the noise. Mm, not so easy. One of the things that we get into is that the levels of noise that we're looking at, as I said, are very, very small. Uh, I make a lot of money troubleshooting fluorescent light fixtures. Uh, a lot of people doing sensitive circuits do. There's a lot of noise in this room. Everybody here has a cell phone, and every cell phone is sitting there blipping, blipping noise. We need to try to keep that out of our measurement. And so we need to be very careful about how it is that we actually set up the cabling to make the measurement. And so I made, made noise density measurements with two different cables. And so what I would tell is you've got to be very careful selecting cables to make this measurement, and also you need to be careful how you dress them. Uh, PicoTest just introduced a brand new cable that we call PDN cable. It's an 18 gigahertz cable, but it's very special in that it, it's a triple shield cable with very low uh, ground resistance. So in an SI cable, we're very interested in the quality of the 50 ohms and we're very interested in the loss of the semi center conductor. And in power integrity, it's exactly the opposite. We don't actually care about the center conductor at all. It doesn't mean anything. But we are interested in the dielectric material because we are interested in having the high quality 50 ohms, but we're very sensitive to the resistance of the external shield. So we kind of inverted the cable. We ended up making an 18 gigahertz cable that has very low shield resistance and doesn't care so much about the center conductor. So we've got to be very careful how we dress those leads and we need to make sure that we have good measurements of the noise floor before we start um, because we want to try to make sure that we're not actually measuring noise. Now we can go ahead and we can set up the measurement. Here's our noiseless power supply, and we have a, a short coax cable, and we pump the power right into the power rail right there. And you can see we also have a DC block, so we can look at that noise density on a noise density meter. And that way we can see exactly what the noise level is as a function of frequency that's going into our clock. And if I measure those different noise levels, and I measured it with three different sources, the noiseless uh, power supply, uh, the switching regulator, and the linear regulator, and you can see that the uh, noiseless power supply has the no lowest noise density, and then the linear regulator has a bump 
in the tens of kilohertz range. And then you can see the switching regulator has some broadband noise at a much higher level. One of the interesting things about that, though, is that this measurement scale, you might not be able to read it, it only goes up to 100 kilohertz. There's something really interesting about that because the switching power supply is a 2.8 megahertz switching power supply. So theoretically, the switching power supply wouldn't have any noise below 2.8 megahertz. And yet the noise that we're seeing is all at about 100 kilohertz. That was one of Thomas New's theories when he said you should use a switching regulator, and that is that it doesn't have any low frequency noise, it only has high frequency noise, which is easy to filter. This says that's not true. We have a 2.8 megahertz power supply, but we have a lot of noise below 2.8 megahertz, and we're gonna investigate why that is, uh, because in, in this case, it turns out to be uh, fascinating. And so now we have to figure out how we're going to improve the sensitivity. Um, you'll see I did a couple of things here. One is that I have a, a monster hybrid capacitor at the input to try to keep extraneous noise off the input. Um, you see I used all short coaxial connections. And I even added a preamplifier, a very low noise preamplifier, so that I can increase the sensitivity of the noise. And I can look at that now on an oscilloscope using spectrum, or I can look at it on a noise density meter or spectrum analyzer. Um, the 20 dB preamplifier, it only has about one nanovolt per root hertz of noise, and so that effectively does improve the noise density by about 16 dB. So it gives us much better uh, sensitivity if we want to look at noise in an oscilloscope. And again, we want to make sure we understand the noise floor, we want to measure the noise floor before we make any real measurements. We don't want to be measuring noise floors. Then we can go ahead and we can make the measurement of uh, noise density. And there it is. And you can see the 1 over F noise. And you can see all the spurs that are on that power supply. Now we need to go ahead and make signal measurements. So this line modulator allows us to actually inject noise in a PSMR fashion. So, so we put in a signal, the signal mixes with the DC, outputs the DC plus the signal, and we put that right into the power supply, and then we can look at the clock analyzer. So we can look at phase noise, or we can look at the spur that's generated, and it'll look something like that. Now, there's a little bit of a problem in doing that. We can look at these signals in a spectrum analyzer, and we're going to see a spur. Um, but wait a second, we're going to see that spur whether it's AM or FM, and AM signals don't create jitter. Only FM signals create jitter. So we need to be able to separate these signals into AM modulation and PM modulation, and that's why we use a signal source analyzer to make this measurement. The phase noise meter has great limiters in it, great compressors, and it's able to distinguish between amplitude and phase modulation so that we don't see the amplitude modulation. If you do look at amplitude modulation, I can tell you you're going to spend a lot of time running in circles and not solving a problem because you will see a spur, and that spur does not result in jitter. And so we need to separate those out. Um, in this case, we're using an RSA 5000 series uh, signal source analyzer or noise, noise meter. It's capable of making phase noise measurements. This is capable of separating AM and FM noise, and it is capable of integrating jitter, and we can look at jitter in any integration band that we like. Looks something like this, and I, uh, we don't need all of these displays to look at phase noise, but I wanted to show them, and so we can show independently what the AM modulation part looks like, what the PM modulation looks like. We can see, we can see the spectrum, we can see spectrogram, and we can also see phase noise. What we're interested in mostly is phase noise and, of course, the jitter. Now, I can look at this in an oscilloscope. If I can get the noise sensitivity down low enough and I add my preamplifier, I can look at noise density. And here it is. And I drew this nice red box that shows that there's no spur there. Now, I wanted to pick a particular spot that had no spur in order to show you this. Um, but here is the noise density, and there's nothing there. And now I can go ahead and I put in a 30 microvolt power signal and then you can see the big spur that comes from 30 microvolts. That's kind of interesting because that's a lot of dB for 30 microvolts. And so one of the things that you learn when you're designing power for sensitive circuits is we're typically looking for noise signals on the order of about one microvolt. A uh, typical clock, and there are really good clocks, but a typical clock, we can destroy its phase noise at about 10 microvolts of, of power rail noise. <clears throat> 
And this allows us to see where it comes from. Now, of course, we could do this at lots of different frequencies, and then we could end up with a map that says, here's the sensitivity of the clock at every different frequency. You end up with this map, and I could say, oh, wow, that's, um, that's about 20 dB for 30 microvolts. So at that frequency, if I inject 3 microvolts, I've damaged the clock. So I need to be below 3 microvolts at that frequency, and I could do that at hundreds of frequencies. Of course, that's challenging. It could be done, but it's kind of challenging. We can also look at how that looks in terms of noise density. Here's noise density to the power supply. And here you can see we added 10, 10 microvolts of noise showed up as a spur. So we put in a 30 microvolt signal. 10 microvolts actually got superimposed on the power rail. That created a 10 dB spur. And so again, that's roughly three microvolts would damage the clock. Not damage in, in, uh, in a physical way, but it would damage the, the jitter of the clock at about three microvolts. And we could do that at lots of frequencies again. So here's another frequency, and uh, here we added 18 microvolts at that frequency, and we ended up with a 20 dB spur. Uh, so th at that frequency, we're allowed 1.8 microvolts, and that would uh, be what it would take to damage the clock. Of course, I can look at these phase noise plots with different power supplies also. So here's the noiseless power supply, linear regulator, and switching regulator. Without getting into numbers, we can just look at it and we can say, wow, that's really interesting. Three different power supplies gives us really three different, very, very different phase noise measurements. And if I look at the switching frequency, here's the 2.8 megahertz switching regulator right there. I can see the spur. And again, you can see in the 2.8 megahertz power supply, we end up with a huge phase noise bump that's much lower in frequency than the switching frequency, and that's problematic. We also don't quite understand it. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, and we can, we can continue to make these measurements at individual frequencies, and we can just add them all up until we, until we end up with a map, but it's kind of a a difficult way to, to do things. We'd end up with hundreds of measurements. So I came up with a system that's a little bit simpler. If we truly measured the clock with a noiseless power supply, and yes, I did say there's no such thing as a noiseless power supply, but let's say we did measure it with as close to zero noise as we can. Battery. What's that? Battery. Batteries are noisy. noisy. Yeah, batteries are noisy. You can't use a battery. It'd be nice if you could use a battery. Uh, they're noisy. Um, you could use a capacitor if you use a hybrid supercapacitor, but ceramic capacitors are noisy. <laughs> What's that? Not ceramic. Ceramic is piezo. Ceramic generates noise, but you could use a hybrid capacitor. You could use a very large film capacitor. Um, but still, you'd have to get down to the point where you really filtered the noise. It'd be thousands and thousands of microfarads. The picture I showed, we're using a 9 millifarad hybrid capacitor. Um, it's a very big capacitor. weighs about 4 pounds. Uh, it does a very good job. Uh, but I would use a hybrid capacitor. But that's not the point. The point is, I ended up with a trace that is the noise-free performance. I started out with the best I can get. And so I would tell you, the very first assessment is, is that good enough? Because if you can't live with the performance of the clock with the noiseless power supply, the clock isn't going to work. Don't bother designing a power supply for it. Throw it away and go find a better clock. Um, in fact, we never pick a device. We pick maybe 15 clocks, and we measure them all, and then we pick the one that gives us the best sensitivity for the dollar or the one that's easiest to filter. But here it is. That is the best they can achieve. Now, I go ahead and I add my linear regulator, and I put the linear regulator, and, and it's right there. And what I really need to know is I don't need to know about the sensitivities of the clock. I need to know that the power supply at 20 kilohertz has 15 dB too much noise. And I need to know that at 10 kilohertz, it has 10 dB too much noise. And uh, at 5 kilohertz, it has 2 dB too much noise. And at 2 kilohertz, it has 1 dB too much noise. And so if I just take the difference between the plot with my power supply and the plot with a noiseless power supply, I will end up with the attenuation required to meet the noise-free performance with my power supply. And I can do exactly the same thing with the switching regulator, and I'll end up with these two charts. These two charts show the attenuation that I need at any frequency to match the noise that I had with my noise-free regulator. 
And so this says that I can use the switching regulator, I just need to come up with 25 dB of attenuation. Or I could use the linear regulator, I just need to come up with 14 dB attenuation. And if I can do that, I can meet the noise-free performance of the clock. That's not bad. So now I figured out how to do it just by looking at the difference between those traces. That's much easier. Now if I look at the power drawn by the clock, I can show that it's an 87 ohm load and I could say, all right, I have this tolerance band on my voltage supply. I'm willing to give up a little bit of voltage. And so that means that I could put a small resistor here. Uh, I don't remember the value of this resistor. I think uh, 2.6 ohms. And so I can tolerate 2.6 ohms there. It'll drop the voltage of the clock slightly and I'll still be able to meet my voltage window for the clock performance. And then I can put an RL, uh, uh, capacitor, RLC, an effective network in order to provide the attenuation. And I can take those curves that I had for attenuation and I can convert those to capacitance. I did that right here. So you don't need that formula, I gave it to you. And so that says if I wanna meet the noise-free performance with my clock, I can use the switching regulator if I had 72 microfarads of capacitance and I could uh, use the linear regulator if I'm willing to add 27 microfarads of capacitance. Of course, that's noiseless capacitance. So we're talking about non-ceramics as a rule. If I look at the different attenuation they did at different frequencies, it will also tell me what the ESR of the capacitor has to be. And so I would tell you that the goal generally is to keep the ESR as high as we possibly can in order to minimize the potential for resonances. And so this says that I could use a 50 milliohm cap and I would meet all of the data points I needed, but it's possible that I'm gonna resonate something else because of the very low ESR. I could also meet all of the attenuation requirements with a 250 milliohm ESR, and I could also meet the attenuation at 450 milliohms of ESR. 450 milliohms of ESR has less chance of resonating. It's also a much less expensive capacitor. So typically we wanna choose the capacitor that has the highest ESR that we can tolerate. And now we've met the requirement at each one of the data points for our linear regulator. And of course I can do the same thing with the switching regulator. And again, here's all of the data points and it says that uh, you know, the highest ESR that I can tolerate will be the best solution. But now I came up with an exact solution. I said, okay, so I measured the noise-free performance of my clock, and I figured out that I could tolerate a 2.6 ohm resistor between the power supply and the clock, and then I could use a 27 microfarad capacitor with 450 milliohms of ESR, and I could use the linear regulator I already have, or I can use a 72 microfarad capacitor with a 30 milliohm ESR and I can use the switching regulator or I can decide I wanna find a better regulator or I could decide I wanna find a better clock. But I have an infinite number of solutions now that I can quantify. One of the interesting things that does come out of this is we uh, fixed our regulator by degrading the regulation. And one of the things that I like to highlight and in particular to semiconductor companies is they are going in the wrong direction. So. If you wanna build a power supply for clocks, you don't wanna make it have better regulation, you want it to have worse regulation. That good regulation means that we have a very clear noise path to the regulator, and it also means that there's nothing that we can use to attenuate uh, the noise. We have to degrade it externally. So good regulation isn't necessarily a good thing, and when it comes to clocks, it's a particularly bad thing. Now, how do you know I'm right? I mean, maybe you think I'm smart, maybe you think I'm not. Um, I always like to know if I got it right anyway. And so here are four traces on a single screen. Here's a phase noise plot of the switching regulator, the linear regulator, the noise-free performance, and the performance with the power supply and the filter that I said you would, you would need. And you see here that when we added the filter, we ended up with exactly the same as we ended up with uh, the noise-free power supply. And so now we haven't under-designed a power supply, we haven't over-designed a power supply, we have exactly met the attenuation required. You can also see with the switching power supply, here's the 2.8 megahertz noise that came from the clock itself. Of course, 2.8 megahertz, that's pretty easy to filter. So the question I keep asking myself is, if I have a 2.8 megahertz power supply, how did I end up with so much noise in the tens of kilohertz. That doesn't make any sense. 
Where did that come from? Um, and we're going to get to that. But if I look at the noise density now of these three power supplies, here are clean plots of the noise densities, and you can see the, uh, the modulator we make has about one nanovolt or two nanovolts per root hertz of noise. Here's the linear regulator, and here's the switching regulator. And sure enough, you can see there's a lot of noise in the switching regulator at low frequency. And we know exactly what we need to do to fix it, because we were able to calculate that based on the resistor that we were willing to add. So where's this noise coming from? Can I see it on an oscilloscope? Yeah, it turns out that I can. If I use the preamplifier, uh, the spectrum analyzer in the Series 6 oscilloscope is good enough to actually see that. It's roughly one microvolt per root hertz at low frequency. Here's the 2.8 megahertz fundamental, 5.6 megahertz, 8.4 megahertz. We can see all of those harmonics. Again, the question is, where the hell does that noise come from? It doesn't make a lot of sense. Here's the noise density plot. And here is the time domain plot of the switch node. Now, most of us wouldn't actually think to look at this, and in fact, I didn't either, until I started chasing where this noise comes from. We typically set the trigger on our scope, and then we look at our switching node, and it would look perfectly well behaved. In this particular chart, I'm looking 60 microseconds after the trigger occurred, and one of the things that you'll notice now is that we have modulation on both edges of our switch node. And that means that we have jitter in the switching frequency of the power supply. Where did the jitter come from our, in our clock? I call this jitter-induced jitter. The jitter in the switching power supply clock resulted in a different jitter for mixing products in our, in our phase lock loop that's inside the clock. Why is it there? We don't really know. There are power supplies that dither the switching frequency on purpose. And they do that in order to create broadband spectrum EMI. It reduces the requirements for the EMI filters, which I think is kind of a nasty trick. Um, you know, instead of creating a filter, we just make the noise broader band and, and all of a sudden it looks better. Uh, and I think broader band noise probably isn't a great thing. Uh, but a lot of power supplies do that and they charge a premium for it. They will tell you that it has uh, spread spectrum EMI improvements internal to it. And they charge money for that. I can tell you this regulator doesn't say that. It doesn't say that it has spread spectrum, doesn't say it has any EMI enhancements. So why is this? I think it's because it has a lousy oscillator. And in general, power supply companies don't really care much about the switching frequency, and they don't think that we do either. I've seen switching frequency jitter much, much worse than this. But this frequency jitter showed up as about 10 microvolts of noise in the power supply rail. That 10 microvolts of power supply noise is what got into the clock and how it gets there. Now, before we go too much further, somebody's going to say, hey, I could probably do better than that by using a ferrite bead, and I typically put ferrite beads on my sensitive circuits anyway. There is one time that's appropriate to use ferrite beads in sensitive circuits. Anybody know when that one time is? Somebody must know. Only one time you would want to use a ferrite bead in a sensitive circuit. Never. That's the only time you would want to use a ferrite bead. Why? Because a ferrite bead is by nature an inductive element. Now, I'm not opposed to inductors, although yesterday I did tell you that inductance is the root of all evil, right? Or at least excess inductance is the root of all evil. So, if excess inductance is the root of all evil, why would I want to go ahead and add one? I also said yesterday that the reason for capacitors is to absorb excess inductance. So if I put in an excess inductance, it means I also need to put in a capacitor to absorb it. So why would I want to add an inductor that's going to make me also add a very large capacitor? That doesn't make any sense. There's a third question. That is, if I was going to put an inductor, why would I want to use a ferrite bead? A ferrite bead is an inductor, but it doesn't specify its inductance. We happen to know that it's inductive. But if you look at a ferrite bead data sheet, it says something like 66 ohms at 100 megahertz. That has nothing to do with inductance. We have no idea whether it's an inductor or how big the inductor is. So I would tell you that in the case that you do think you need a ferrite bead, I would much rather see you choose a chip inductor because then it's characterized and we know what it is. And yes, you will need to add a capacitor to absorb that inductance, but we could do it. 
And now, depending on how it is that we damp that inductor, we'll either end up with a nicely attenuated signal, or we're going to end up adding noise in that, uh, in that resonant frequency. Will we see it? You bet. Um, it only takes microvolts. There's plenty of noise in the air. All of the noise will focus on all of these resonances. And if I put a noise density meter there, I can see that peak loud and clear. I have lots of pictures of, uh, of noise density on RSAs. So if you're interested during the, the breaks, I'd be happy to show them to you. So, so we can't actually use a ferrite bead or an inductor without also adding a significant resistor or the very large capacitor because somehow we must damp that resonance. One possibility, and people do ask me this a lot, because they say, what if I can't tolerate the voltage drop? Well, I could put an inductor in parallel with the resistor. And I can come up with a solution again that will minimize that peaking. And yes, it will still involve the use of a relatively large inductor and a relatively large capacitor in order to absorb it. But if you really couldn't tolerate that voltage drop, that is one way that you could avoid it. There are other solutions. So, for example, I know that Analog Devices makes a voltage regulator for clocks. And I know that so does Texas Instrument, and not the ones that Masashi was making, but they do make some truly uh, what they call RF regulators. They're interesting devices. They're linear regulators. They're very, very tiny and very, very expensive. Um, a regulator like this one, I think, is about 4 or $5 in quantity. And one of the things that's interesting about it is count the number of capacitors that go with this regulator. So you got this, this tiny little regulator, but I still needed to add five ceramic capacitors to make it work, and five relatively big ones, 10 microfarad capacitors. So in addition to the $5, I also need to buy all the capacitors. My resistor only took one capacitor. I actually won by using a resistor. The resistor was much less expensive, it met my noise requirements, and it used much fewer parts. And so I won't say that you can't use these. I can tell you they work quite well, but they do come at a significant price, and they do require an awful lot of capacitors. And one of them in particular, um, actually two in this particular regulator, you'll notice that uh, they have the internal reference brought out so they can put a capacitor on it, and they also have the input to the pass stage brought out, so you can put a pack capacitor across that one also. Most of the noise in the regulators is generated by the reference, and so very often you'll see little regulators like this with a recommendation to put 100 or 1,000 microfarads on the voltage reference. That's a pretty big capacitor. Uh, so I'm not really a fan. But does it work? Yeah, it does. Here's the phase noise plot of our clock along with the uh, analog devices or linear technology ultra low noise regulator. And that does exactly meet the noise free performance. It does, just at quite a price. What about simulating phase noise? So I said at the end of the day, whether we like it or not, we will be doing end-to-end -end simulation. Most of the jitter and phase noise in, in the oscillator actually comes from the power supply. And so how can we simulate the oscillator without simulating the power supply? The truth is that you can't, and we don't. We do simulate uh, the power supply with the, the oscillator, and here's a typical oscillator, and there is the phase noise that comes from the, from the power supply. And that allows us to look at how much of the phase noise comes from the oscillator and how much of the phase noise comes from the power supply. Now, there are a few other options. One thing that I ran into while I was writing this paper is that um, I have a box of clocks, and I picked one at random, and I, I soldered it to my little board, and I tried to make the measurements, and I couldn't get any noise out of it. I broke my first rule. I said, you, you know, every, every time you make a setup, you need to measure something you know in order to make sure the setup is working properly. And I didn't do that. Dumb move. So I cranked up the noise even more, and then I changed out the cables because I figured the cables must be bad. Then I changed the, the linear modulator because I figured that must be bad. I could not make noise come out of this thing at all. So I finally, I grabbed another board, the, the demo board we have, and I plugged it in, and the noise was off the screen. And so I looked at this uh, clock I mounted, and it was made by SI Lab. And I called SI Lab, and I said, what the hell did you put in this thing? And they laughed, and they said, you know, the funny thing is, you cannot generate enough noise to cause jitter in that clock, and people won't buy it. And I said, how come? And they said, because it costs a dollar more. <laughs> 
And that's really interesting because that dollar more would be an awful lot cheaper than the linear technology power supply had to add. And so one of the things that I'll tell you is that before you go designing power for sensitive circuit, you need to make sure your circuit is sensitive. If you design the SI lab uh, clock into your circuit, you don't really care how much noise you put into it. It doesn't matter. And so we do need to know whether or not it's actually a sensitive circuit before we go ahead and we, uh, we add that stuff to it. Now, not all voltage regulators are equal. Measure lots of them. I said, we typically don't choose a part. And this I find odd. I mean, a lot of companies and a lot of smart people I work with, they make some really odd decisions. I had a call from a large computer, a CPU manufacturer, probably the largest in the world. They were having a problem with a power supply and asked me to come in and take a look. So I took a look at it. It was another one of these voltage regulators that had no compensation pin, no way to fix. And I looked at it, I worked on it for a day, and I said, I'm sorry, I don't think you're going to be able to make this power supply work. We're going to need to pick a different power supply. I said, no, no, I have to make this one work. And I said, well, what's so special about this, this power supply? And they said, well, you didn't get to pick the power supply. I said, that's odd, it's your circuit. You didn't choose the power supply, who did? And he said, oh, our program manager chose the power supply. And I said, what? And they said, yes, our program manager chose the power supply. And I said, so what happens if this power supply doesn't work? And he said, you don't understand. My job is to make that power supply work. Uh, and I find things like that mind boggling, but I will tell you, I hear it all the time. How did the program manager come to choose this regulator? Um, he might like the company, he might have a deal with the company, uh, maybe he plays golf with the sales guy, who knows, but he chose the regulator for some reason. I was doing work for an instrument company and I ran into a similar problem. They had a problem in power integrity in an instrument front end at 70 gigahertz. And the guy swore to me, it's not a power integrity problem, it's at 70 gigahertz. I said, look, I know sensitive circuits, I'm telling you it's the power supply. I helped him fix his power supply. He was appreciative and it worked. I said, do you want to know how I knew that it was your power supply? And he said, no. Okay. Um, you want to share with me how you chose that particular voltage regulator for your RF front end? And he said, certainly. Figures of merit. I said, I love you. That's awesome. It's exactly how you do it. Figures of merit. So tell me about your figures of merit. He said, it had to be from linear technology. It had to have an inhibit pin. It had to be really small, and it needed to be really cheap. I said, were any of your figures of merit related to power? I said, what do you mean? Um, okay. I said, I, un I understand most of these. I do. I understand you needed to have an enable pin. I understand the URF front end is really small, so you needed a small regulator. That 70 gigahertz front end, it's cheap? And he said, no, no, of course not. I said, so how did you come up with it? It's got to be really cheap. He said, oh, you don't know my company. Uh, uh, so we never choose a regulator. We, we buy dozens of regulators. We measure probably hundreds or if not, you know, a thousand a year, both for our customers and for ourselves. So we can characterize them and we know everything there is to know about them. And then we choose the one that's most appropriate. If we were choosing one for clock, we would try to find the one that's easiest for us to filter. Um, I gave a paper a few years back on the benefits of gallium nitride. Anybody here working with gallium nitride yet? Um, it will take over the world. 1979, I got my first samples of silicon MOSFETs. Alex Ledeau changed my world, and not for the better. Um, I swore after testing my first six MOSFETs that nobody in the world would ever use them. You'd have to be nuts to use MOSFETs. And people thought I was crazy, but you know what? I turned out to be right. I was 40 years early, but we are all going to leave silicon and we are all, all going to go to gallium nitride. Alex Ludo told us that. He also invented gallium nitride. I did bet against them once. I'm not betting against them again. But people misunderstand the benefits of gallium nitride. We think it's about switching and it's not. It's about a lot of things other than switching. And one of them is it has no noise. And in order to prove this, we built a linear regulator in conjunction with Alex Ledeau. We built a linear regulator that had more than one gigahertz of active bandwidth and no noise. Doesn't require capacitors and it can power anything you like. Gallium nitride will take over the world, I just don't know quite how long. 
Uh, this TPS 7A4501, this is an eval board we got from Texas Instrument. You can see that big peak in it. So that peak generates phase noise and jitter. Um, interestingly, this is a mirror image of the power rail impedance. I can tell you what the impedance of the power supply is from that noise plot. And in fact, I can even tell you what the phase margin of the control loop is in that power supply from that noise plot. Everything is, shows up in that one plot. And so this is um, relatively significant. Voltage references and typical linear regulators, they do that also. Here's an LM317 voltage regulator with three different capacitors. And you can see those very large noise bumps and all of those noise bumps will show up as phase noise, jitter, and spurs. Voltage references turn out to be even more sensitive and the reason is because voltage references have outstanding voltage regulation, which means no series resistance and no damping. They're also very low power devices, which means that the effective inductance of the device is much, much higher than a voltage regulator. So it's very difficult to get the noise out of a voltage reference. It takes much larger capacitors to do it. But they all exhibit this. We can see all of them by looking at phase noise meters. And we just go from regulator to regulator and we can measure the noise density of lots of them really quickly. Uh, here's another example. Here's just a lot of different clocks all measured simultaneously so we can see what their noise densities look like. Uh, manufacturers have all kinds of tricks on how to improve regulation and how to use multiple control loops. And what they generally don't look at is what that means in terms of noise, but it does generally generate lots of noise. So again, the rule is don't just choose a regulator. You need to choose it based on your figure of merit. And if you're designing power for sensitive circuits, then that is your figure of merit. There is one more thing to consider, and I actually have an article coming out uh, uh, in Signal Integrity Journal about this. VRMs have at least five different noise sources. I talked about this yesterday. We need to consider all of the ways that noise gets there. And this is where Masashi screwed up. Masashi thought that building a regulator for oscillators meant that he had to have really high power supply rejection so that the noise from the switching regulators would not get through the regulator or appear at the clock. That's true, except that he also designed a power supply that had terrible noise. And so when we look at noise in the clock, we need to look at the sum of all of the ways that the noise gets there. It gets there from the input source. It gets there from current variations in the regulator. It gets there from current variations on the power rail. It gets there from the internal noise density, and it also gets there from the air. And this plagues everybody. I can tell you, I worked on the forward calorimeter at the accelerator at CERN for a while. A fascinating project to work on and also crazy sensitive. It was uh, one of the fascinations of my life. I ended up actually working with my daughter, uh, who was also a nuclear physicist, and she was working on the accelerator, so I got to work with her. And she was having noise problems like this, and she called me and she said, Dad, you need to, to come to U of A and, and pack up the car with equipment. And by the way, we don't have any money. Um, so I did, and I packed up a car full of equipment, I ran to U of A, and I helped my daughter and her professor for a day. And at the end of the day, I held up a near-field probe to the ballast and their fluorescent lights, and I said, there you go. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I troubleshoot fluorescent lights, but you've got to watch stuff like that. Um, that's all I got for you today. You can... Uh, you can find more information. Uh, most of my articles are published on Signal Integrity Journal. This particular topic is one that I'm really fascinated by, and you'll see that I've done it as articles, I've done it as presentations, and I've even done it as webinars. Uh, I even do it as a workshop. So if you want to find more information, it's easy to do it. Uh, all of our application notes and articles uh, can typically be found on our our blog at picotest.com. I want to thank all of you guys for attending. And again, I want to thank uh, DigiTronics for inviting me and for Tektronics for bringing the equipment. So thanks very much. Hope you learned something. <laughs>